Gina, Jay, and Lorelai from Cosplay Repair will now walk us through the ins and outs of cosplay wigs. They'll go over everything you need to know to get started on your next cosplay. And of course, they're all wearing wigs. Gina is wearing a long blue green wig, Jay is wearing a bright red wig, and Lorelai is wearing a blonde wig with Odango buns on top. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to our All About Wigs panel, hosted by the Cosplay Repair Station. Cosplay Repair Station, or CRS for short, is a volunteer-based organization that runs repair stations at conventions across the Pacific Northwest, including Emerald City Comic Con, Software Con, and of course Geek Girl Con. We've been doing this for about 10 years now, so we've seen quite a few wig repairs. And we get a lot of questions about wigs, so we put together this panel to help answer those questions. Feel free to follow us on social media at Cosplay Repair Station, on Facebook and Instagram, or at Cosplay Repair on Twitter. Also, I highly recommend that you check out our website. Uh, I've put the link in this video. On that website, there is a PDF version of the brochure that we hand out at our wig panel when we do this in person. It has a lot of information that I'm not going to be covering in this video, and I will be pointing out in the video where there would be additional information available, so I highly encourage that you check that out. With that, I'll go ahead and get started. Hi, my name is Gina, aka Boss Monkey, and I'm the founder and general manager of the Cosplay Repair Station. I'm going to be joined today by my two wig station leads, Jay and Lorelai. Here are the topics we're going to cover today. Anatomy and types of wigs and wig fibers, putting on a wig, including pinning your hair, wig caps, and special considerations for heavy wigs and clip-ons, cutting a wig, both angle cuts and blunt cuts, spiking a wig using the teasing method, coloring a wig using both dye and hair chalk, detangling a wig, specifically a long curly wig, washing and storing wigs, and lastly, attaching pieces to a wig. Anatomy of a wig. The first thing to note about wigs is that there are a lot of different types of fibers. First up is spun plastic. This is your typical Halloween wig. The fibers are thick and coarse and often very shiny. We do not recommend spun plastic wigs for cosplay unless you want something cheap to practice on or if you plan to do a fully spiked wig. Because the fibers are so stiff, they work quite well for spiking if you can find one that has enough fibers. Next up is Kanekalon. The fibers are thinner and softer but not heat resistant. So if you want to curl or straighten them, you'll need to use boiling water or a steamer respectively. Talk about these techniques in the wig pamphlet. And similar to spun plastic, these fibers are usually quite shiny. You can remove the shine by soaking the wig in water with a splash of fabric softener. You can usually find Kanekalon and Sister Fiber Toyokalon wigs for not too expensive. Next is a wig from Arta Wigs, which is mostly Hyperlon fiber. Hyperlon has less shine than Kanekalon, but is a bit stiff by comparison. Hyperlon is also heat resistant up to 400 degrees. So these wigs are perfect for spiking. The Arda Wig Silky line is a different fiber that is softer and more tangle resistant, so better for longer styles. But in terms of tangle resistance, the best fibers out there are Allura and Futura. This last wig is from Epic Cosplay Wigs and is made of Futura, another heat resistant fiber that is incredibly soft and tangle resistant. All in all, there are a lot of different fiber types and different advantages to each. It's important to know what kind of styling you will need to do when looking at what type of wig to buy. Generally speaking, wigs that are not heat resistant can't handle anything above 150 degrees temperature wise. Heat resistant wigs can go, typically go up to about 400 degrees. So if you're planning to use a curling iron or a straightening iron, most of those tools start at around 300 degrees. So you'll want to make sure to look for a heat resistant wig. There are ways to curl and straighten wigs that are not heat resistant, uh, but it makes it a lot easier if you can just use a tool. There are two different types of parts that you will see. This wig has a, kind of a swirl part. The other type are ones that have these skin parts. 
So something to note is a wig that has the skin part in it, if you try to pull the fibers back to get rid of that part, it's not really going to work. And that's because the wefts, I'll talk about those in just a second, are sewn facing a specific direction. Same with your part, your wig that has no part. If you were to try and force a part, it might not work so well. It's a little hard to see here, but you can see the fibers don't quite want to play. So if you are planning to add a part into your wig, check and see if the wig can support that. Because the way in which wigs are made is they have these individual rows of fibers called wefts that are sewn into a cap. Pull that so you can see that a little bit. So the way in which the fibers are sewn is going to dictate how the hair wants to fall. If you look on the inside here, you can see all the rows of where the wefts are sewn. They're attached the top to a lace portion. And then we've got these little ear flappies, we like to call them on the sides. And a lot of wigs will have near the back and bottom these straps. And these can hook into these little loops here. Just like that. And these are used to help adjust the tension on the wig. So going back to our wefts, say we wanted to do a nice spike on this wig. Would that work? Well, if we pull the fibers up, we're going to see the wefts underneath. So in this case, if you wanted to spike your wig, you either want to look for a wig that is designed for spiking and therefore has a lot of fiber at the top, or you may need to add wefts to the wig to help cover these holes. Same deal with putting a wig into a ponytail or into pigtails. Unless the wig already has wefts sewn in an upward direction to enable the hair to be gathered that way, when you pull the fibers in that direction, you're going to expose the wefts. Now, a lot of wig companies do sell separate wefts. They look like this, and you can just sew them into your wig. It's another easy way to add small pieces of color to a wig it's by sewing in different colored wefts. Putting on a wig. Next we're going to talk about putting on a wig. Now as you can see thanks to the quarantine I have quite a bit of hair right now. There's a couple of different ways that I could put it up. My preferred method is a French braid. If you don't know how to French braid, you can always do just a regular braid, but the benefit of a French braid is it does a good job of evenly distributing the hair across your head. A lot of wigs will have kind of a, a little bit of a pouch, either in the top back or in the bottom area, and that's where your hair fits nicely. The other method, if you don't want to do a braid or a French braid, is to do pin curls. And that's a really nice way of evenly distributing the hair across your head. It also makes a nice base for pinning into, especially if you put a line of pin curls along the front. I'll go ahead and French braid my hair. Uh, it doesn't have to look pretty since it's going underneath the wig cap. 
Note that I'm simply bobby pinning the end of the braid in place and not even putting a hair tie on it. Hair ties can add a lot of bulk underneath the wig cap and I want to avoid that. Now, if you're familiar with wigs, you're probably also familiar with wig caps. But just in case you aren't, I just want to reiterate the three reasons why you should always wear a wig cap underneath your wig. The first reason is that it helps keep all of your hair in place and uh, makes it uh, harder to see the hair underneath the wig. The second reason is that it gives something to pin the wig to. You'll want to pin the wig to the wig cap and pin the wig cap to your hair. And the third reason is that the wig cap helps prevent the natural oils from your hair from getting into your wig. There are two different types of wig caps. The first, these nylon wig caps. They come in um, a couple different shades of beige, brown, and black. We recommend these wig caps uh, specifically if you have very short hair or if you have curly hair with a lot of little flyaways. They do a great job of keeping everything intact. And there are also these mesh wig caps. You'll notice they have a hole at the top. This is by design. And these work really well if you have very long hair. So I'll show how to put on each of these. For the mesh wig caps, you want to put them on like a headband. So pull it down all the way and then pull the whole thing back up to your hairline and then pull the top up and secure it with a bobby pin. For the nylon one, because you don't have that hole in the back, I like to put it on from the back coming forward. And that's because all of my hair is usually pinned in the back and that way I can keep it secured. I pull it down below my hairline and then push it back up. And the other trick here is if you've got little flyaways and wispies that escaped, you don't want to use your finger to push them back in because your fingers are designed to grab things. So your finger will do a great job of pulling the wispy back out. Instead, you wanna use one of these rat tail combs. Use the tail portion of it to conveniently tuck the flyaways back in. Once you have the wig cap on, you'll want to pin the wig cap in place. Uh, for the mesh wig caps, I like to use bobby pins. For the nylon ones, I like to use big barrettes so that I'm not poking holes in my wig cap as much. At a bare minimum, you want to put one pin on either side of your temple, but also putting one pin at the top and either one or two in the back of your head right around the base of your neck uh, is also a good recommendation. Especially if you have a heavy wig or a lot of hair, adding extra pins in the top does help. One question we sometimes get is how to choose what color of wig cap to wear underneath your wig. It's open to personal preference whether you want to match the wig cap to your skin color or to the wig itself, but generally speaking, uh, we would recommend to go darker so that that way if the wig cap is somehow visible underneath the wig, it just looks like shadow. Another question we get a lot is how to color your eyebrows to match your wig. There are a bunch of different ways to do this. This is just my personal preferred method. I like to use a NYX brand jumbo eye pencil in white and first um, apply that onto the eyebrow. While it's still tacky, I use a matte eyeshadow and an angle brush and paint that into my eyebrow. For this particular wig, I don't have an exact color match, so I'm mixing green and black, but it seems to do the trick nicely. The last step is finally to put the wig on. Generally, we like to go from front to back, 
kind of lining up the front of the wig with the front of your head and then stretching the wig back over your pinned up hair and wig cap and uh, setting it down into place, coming back around to the front, making sure that the little side flaps are lined up with the sides of your temples and making sure that none of the fibers are caught underneath the wig. Once you've got the wig on, again, you'll want to pin the wig in place, uh, either using bobby pins or using wig pins, which uh, kind of look like broken bobby pins. And the wig pins go in at an angle and then slide into place, and they do a great job of securing the wig. A recommendation for adding pigtails or ponytails, if you can, put them a little bit higher up on your head so that they're not fighting gravity as much and pulling you the hair down. Once you've got the wig pinned on, doing the shake test is a great way to know whether it's going to be staying on your head. If you feel any movement or if it feels loose at all, you may want to add more pins. For heavy wigs, you'll want to add a wig pin along the crown of the head. Keep in mind that if the wig has a skin top or fake part, that area will be too solid to pin through. This particular wig has a skin top, so I'm putting the pin in ahead of that. I'm also pulling the fibers out of the way to make sure I can get the pin into the wig. For the wig pins, you'll want to go in at an angle, then slide the pin in place. We like to joke that if you feel it scraping against your scalp, you know it's going in properly. We prefer to use the wig pins that don't have the nubs at the end, as these will stab through a nylon wig cap. But if you don't want to end up with holes in your nylon wig cap, be sure you're wearing a mesh wig cap. In addition to the wig pin at the crown of the head, heavy wigs require additional pins along the front. One recommendation for heavy wigs is to put your hair up in pin curls along the hairline, as this makes a sturdy base to pin the wig into. Most ponytail and pigtail clips are a section of wefts threaded into a claw clip. A stretchy drawstring is used to tighten the hair around the clip. Be sure the string is tied and tucked in before putting on the clip. To keep gravity from trying to pull the ponytail down, place the ponytail near the crown of the head and make sure that the claw clip is going into the wefts rather than simply attaching to the fibers. For pigtails, make sure they are even so one side isn't pulling. Another thing to keep heavy wigs on is you can buy these little comb clips and uh, sew them into the wig. They just snap open, clip into place. Some wigs may even come with combs already pre-sewn into the wig. Now this particular wig isn't a long wig, but it's designed to have ponytail or pigtail clips attached to it. So they already went ahead and added these combs in. The last suggestion for heavy wigs is they do sell these velvet headbands that you can put on underneath the wig. They were originally designed for lace front wigs and they do a great job of securing the wig to your head. Cutting a wig. Unless you have a very patient friend, most of the time you're going to be doing your styling on a wig head. Now, these styrofoam wig heads are pretty cheap, uh, but one thing to note is that there are two different sizes of the female wig heads, both of which are significantly smaller than your actual head. One way to get around this is to look for the male foam wig heads. Another option is to simply add paper to the back of the wig head to pat it out and make it a more accurate size. Now this is critical for when you are cutting bangs especially, to know where the bangs need to stop on your face as opposed to on the wig head. Just like with fabric scissors, whatever scissors you use to cut hair, you'll want to only use those to cut hair as that will help them stay sharp. Now the proper way to hold actual hair scissors is put your thumb in the larger hole and your ring finger in the smaller hole. Your pinky rests on the little tail and then your index and middle finger rest above the hole. Now when doing a blunt cut 
on a wig, if you just cut straight across, it's going to look very ugly and very unnatural. There are two different ways to fix that. If you have thinning shears, that is a great way to grade the hair so that it looks a bit more natural. And thinning shears are another type of scissors. They're designed to only cut some of the hair with each cut, so you naturally get a bunch of different layers. If you don't have thinning shears, you can also take your regular scissors and doing a number of small vertical cuts, slowly grade the hair that way. To do a blunt cut, make small cuts while holding the scissors vertically. Most wigs have more wefts in the bangs than in the rest of the wig, so be sure to cut through all layers. For bangs especially, try the wig on first and use a bobby pin to mark where the bangs should be cut. In general, go slow as you can always cut off more if you need to. Make sure the fibers are laying at the right angle while making your cuts so you don't have uneven sections. For cutting pointed bangs or shaping the hair around the side of the face, hold the scissors pointed downwards and make a series of small cuts while moving the scissors down the hair. Spiking a wig. Next, I'll show you one way in which to make a nice spike on a wig. Now, keep in mind that if the wig does not have enough fibers, along the fibers the are not sewn in a way that allows for the wig to be pulled up to make a spike, it's going to look ugly. You're going to end up exposing the wefts, and the way to fix this would be to add additional wefts, or if you can, look for a wig that already has a lot of extra fibers sewn in a way that allows for spiking. A lot of heavily spiked wigs are actually multiple wigs sewn together so that there are enough fibers there to allow for the wig fibers to be pulled in different directions. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to gather a group of fibers to make my actual spike. And you can see when I start to pull these fibers up, even though this wig does have a lot of fibers and is really intended for some spiking style, even doing that, uh, you still expose the wefts by pulling this up. So for a uh, better look overall, I would end up adding wefts to this wig to help hide these bald spots. Once you have your section for your spike, you'll want to take a nice thin comb and tease the base of the spike. This helps to add volume to the spike as well as some stiffness. A good measure for when you're done is when the spike can stand up on its own. Once you've got your nice teased spike, you wanna take your comb and just lightly comb the outside. And this is really to make the outside of the spike smooth so you don't see all that matted hair. Once you've got a nice smooth spike, go ahead and hit it with some hairspray. We like the Got To Be brand. Once you've hit the bottom with the hairspray and you can see I'm focusing on the side that is going to be most impacted by gravity. This is just to keep it stable while I'm working on the rest of it. So once you've got that hairspray applied, Go ahead and use a blow dryer on a cool temperature setting uh, just to help speed up the dry time. Once that is dry, you can trim the top to make it into a nice pointed spike. Again, I'm using angled cuts with my scissors. I then apply a bit of hair glue, again, got to be brand at the tip of the spike. And I wanna mention specifically that this is hair glue that is different than hair gel. Hair gel is clear, the hair glue is white, and hair gel works with the chemicals in your hair. Once I've got the tip glued, I'll again use the blow dryer to speed up that drying process and then I'll hit the entire spike 
with another wave of hairspray. And you can see once that's dry, that's a pretty solid spike. Coloring a wig. Hi, I am Jay, also known as Space Unicorn. So wig dyeing in the more traditional dye process. Uh, that's probably not the best term for it, simply because it's more like wig tinting or wig shading. This is because wig fibers are not as porous, so the dye doesn't soak in like it would with cotton fabric. It would just sit on the surface of a wig fiber and try to stain it. So it's a bit more tedious than you would with fabric, and it does take time. So what to consider for your wig dye? Make sure your wig is synthetic simply because dyes are going to come in two different kinds. There is going to be a regular dye that is meant for natural fibers such as cotton. Then there is also going to be a polyester dye. Uh, these dyes are for man-made fibers such as lycras, your spandex. The dyes you want to use for the best result. Um, not that you can't use a regular dye, you just have to use other items such as vinegar or salt just to make sure you can get that dye to adhere to your wig fibers. Your wig also has to be heat resistant because there's going to be heat when it comes to dyeing. There's no way of avoiding it. Um, this is because heat is going to let the dyes attach itself to the fibers. Another thing to consider is what color you are trying to aim for. You aren't going to get a very deep color when it comes to wig dyeing because, like I mentioned, you're just staining, staining the wig rather than changing it completely. So if you want a deep color, unfortunately you're going to have to buy a wig of that color. You can't get pretty close. What you have to do is, you, if you can't get that specific shade you need, you can get a wig that's a step higher in color, so it's a little bit lighter and you can dye it down to the tone you need. You can't go backwards, so make sure the wig you have, for example, if you have a wig of a strawberry blonde color like this, you can go maybe pink, darker pink, red, um, but you can't go backwards. You can't turn this light blonde because that requires bleaching and eats away at your at the fiber, so you're gonna damage your wig significantly. You also can't turn this green because it's not in the same color family. You would have to maybe use a little bit of blue, but it won't be a true green. You always have that little pinkest color because again, you're staining the wig instead of changing what's in here. The best wig to use is definitely going to be white because you can go pretty much any direction you want with white, just like you would with a regular sheet of paper. Uh, I want to make a note that uh, if you do want to go black from a white wig, it's best to use a darker wig because when it comes to dyes, there is no true dot black dye that isn't trademarked. Um, a lot of the dyes are going to be a very, very dark purple. So if you try to go from a white wig to a true black, your black wig will end up where it's a very deep shade of purple. Um, instead, if you got a, like a gray wig, you can sort of tint it into black. Um, it's a little brown, you maybe can turn it more natural. And the last thing to consider for your dyeing process is what kind of dye you are using. I've already mentioned that there are two different kinds of dye, the natural fiber one, the regular one, and the polyester synthetic dyes that are made for man-made fibers. Uh, you would usually see these come in either liquid or powder form. Um, when it comes to RIT dye, they do have a polyester specific dye. This is called Rid Dye More. 
Um, I only have a regular writ die due to the quarantine, so which you can use, like I've mentioned, you just have to use salt and vinegar. Uh, for powder dyes, you have to make sure you mix it beforehand and take into consideration how much water you're using. The more water that you use, the more muted um, colors you're going to get, the less water you use, the more vibrant, but it still won't be as vibrant as you probably would expect. So when it comes to wig dyeing, you usually have to dye the wig maybe three or four times. Um, using a synthetic dye will cut that down a little bit more. You will see sometimes on the internet that you can dye your wig using acrylic ink. So it could be FW ink, it's sometimes called India ink. Um, these are acrylic. Some people use like the refills for Copic markers. Um, you would mix it with the iso isopropyl uh, alcohol. Uh, Seventy six percent is usually okay. I just happen to have ninety one percent. What you would do with this is that you will mix it uh, one to five up to one to thirty ratio with isotope being one um, because and make sure you wear a mask because what's going to happen is you're going to sort of soak your wig in the mixture and let the alcohol dry up um, and then it'll dry up with heat so make sure you leave it somewhere it's either sunny or somewhere warm if you feel like using the blow dryer, make sure you wear a mask because the fumes of the alcohol is going to come back at you. Um, what happens is that once the alcohol dries up, the ink will sort of stain your wig. And once again, these are all wig staining rather than an actual dye like you expect with fabric. So now I've talked about the three major factors you should consider when you're trying to dye your wig. Um, there's a lot of tutorials out there that will show you which each method. I'm only going to show you the regular rip dye with salt and vinegar mixed in, but only briefly because there is also a lot of different ways to dye the, your wig. Some people would boil hot water. I just use a bucket that is filled with hot water. The boil, uh, boiling the hot water first usually will give you the best results because that gives more heat and once again it's important that your wig is heat resistant. Um, you would find that some methods work more for what you have on hand. I don't have a um, pan I am not using for cooking so I use a bucket. Um, you also would find that your wig, depending on what brand you buy, it might not react as well with other brands. That's why you always should always do a small um, strand test, either if you can cut off a little bit and sort of do a dye. Um, you also will find that the dye you're using, if you're mixing colors, you want to make sure your ratios will give um, what you want. So always test it, try different methods if you can. Uh, try different dyes if you can, you will find some will just work better for you. So what I will show you is just the basics of what most, aside from acrylic ink dyeing, what most liquid and powder dyes will show you. So I've already prepared a dye bath with hot water and my dye mixture. Since I am using regular dye, I also added vinegar and salt to it. Before you put your wig in, get your wig a little bit wet. This will help the dye flow through the strands more evenly the moment you put your wig into the dye bath. With a gloved hand, you just stir your wig in the dye bath. You can do this several times over the process. When it comes to how long to leave your wig in the dye, it really depends on how you are dyeing. For the method I'm showing you, this can take somewhere between six to a full day simply because the water I'm using will cool down 
um, as time goes on. If you're using the boiling pot method, you would take it out more immediately because of the water temperature. When your wig is ready to come out of the dye bath, rinse it out a little bit to get the extra droplets out of the way. Then put it on a wig head and let it dry out. You can lay it on a flat surface if you want, but make sure you have some sort of heat to evaporate the liquid. Otherwise, your wig will just sit in more dyed water over a period of time. So comparing the dyed wig with the white original wig, as you can see, the inside of the wig is a lot more dyed than the outside because once again, the wig fiber is not as porous as fabric. The dye is more staining the strands, as you can see, rather than soaking into it like it did with the wig cap inside. As you can see, it's sort of just taken the white wig sh a little bit shade darker. If I want to go more blue, I would redo this dye over and over again. A good suggestion is to keep the dye mixture that you have um, and just reboil it again, just so you have the same shade that you're aiming for. And that concludes the wig dyeing process with the traditional dyes. Uh, I hope you learned something from it. Uh, if you decide to do some wig dyeing during this fun quarantine time, go ahead and post it. Uh, use hashtag CauseBreak, tag us at CosplayRepair cause, or at CosplayRepairStation, depending on which social media you're using. Hashtag GeekGirlCon. Um, and we will see it, we will like it, we will love it, and we will reblog and share it. <laughs> So, bye. Hi, I'm Lorelai, or Lori Chicken Cosplay on Instagram, and I'm going to talk to you about hair chalk. So, hair chalk can come in a palette that looks similar like this, or you can often find individual colors um, by themselves and just pick out the ones that you're looking for. Today, I'm going to use two different colors, a red and an orange, and I'm going to blend them so they make a nice flame-colored spike like we see here on this cherry bomb wig. So if you want one color, you can just brush it directly onto the wig and that'll make it one very strong color. But because I want more of a gradient from peach to red, what I like to do is I like to scrape a little bit off onto the palette and then use a brush to apply it um, so that it becomes one color towards the tip. So here I'm going to start on this one that doesn't have as much color and I'm going to brush on with the actual chalk the peachy color because that can be sort of a base. And then when I get uh, the layer of color that I want I'm going to scrape some of this red into the palette here like this so that you get it on the board and then I'm going to start at the very tip where I want the most amount of color and slowly build up that color and then put less and less as we reach the peach color at the bottom. And if you don't get enough of the red, you can go at the tip and just lightly go with the red and that'll make it more intense. So as you can see, we have a nice color gradient of a darker red to a sort of peachy. And you can do that um, at all of the different tips here. Now this isn't permanent, so it might come off on your hands like I have here. Um, but it is a lot easier to do than a Sharpie dye. You don't have to do deal with the fumes that Sharpies have. Um, it also is temporary, so if you have like a light colored wig, like this cherry bomb wig, of course this is very styled, but if you have a light colored wig that you might want to use for a different cosplay, you could always use the hair chalk instead of the Sharpie dye, and then if you wanted to use it for something else, you could use it for something else. So that's pretty much all there is to say about um, <laughs> hair chalk. It's very simple to use. It's very good for beginners. It's not permanent, but it does spare the wig if you want to use it for something else. Detangling a wig. 
Unfortunately, the only true way to keep a wig from getting tangled is to never wear the wig. Any movement of the fibers are going to start to tangle them. There are some wigs that uh, the fibers are more tangle resistant than others, but at some point you're probably going to have to detangle your wig. Detangling curly wigs is just a little bit more complicated than detangling a straight wig. So I'm going to show you how to detangle a curly wig and keep in mind that all of these same steps do apply to a straight wig with the exception of recurling the wig at the end. For detangling curly wigs, you'll want to go curl by curl. So you'll first start with using an alligator clip to section off a portion of the hair ideally one single curl. You'll then want to take some type of detangling solution. We use a homemade solution that is mostly water with just a splash of fabric softener added. You can go ahead and spray that on. It doesn't need a whole lot. Lightly work it into the wig. You'll then want to use either a wide tooth comb or we like to use these combs that have rotating tines and they work really well for not pulling the fibers out of the wig. You'll then want to work from the bottom of the curl up to the top and you want to be very gentle. Don't pull on the fibers as this can stretch them and don't be afraid if there's a really bad knot to use your fingers to pull it apart. If your wig is very, very tangled, you may want to wash the wig before detangling it, as this will help reform some of the curls. Once the curl is fully brushed out, you can just spray it with some water and then twist it back into shape. If it doesn't look good the first time, try twisting it the other direction. The beauty of curly wigs is that the fibers are intended to be curled, so they will return to their natural curly state with a little bit of help. Again, you'll go curl by curl using the alligator clips to segregate the sections that have been detangled versus the sections that still need to be detangled. And if you don't want to use the fabric softener or water trick, another good product is oil sheen spray. Oil sheen spray just adds a little bit of slickness to the fibers and helps them from getting tangled and it also smells nice. Washing and storing a wig. I personally like to wash my wig after every full day of wearing, but it can be a bit of a personal preference. One thing to keep in mind though is that by washing your wig, you are going to wash out any styling you've put into your wig. Specifically, any hairspray, hair glue, or if you've straightened or curled your wig, you will undo that as well. So keep that in mind before you decide to wash your wig. Wash your wigs in the sink or for a long wig in the bathtub. Start by flipping the wig inside out and applying some shampoo along the cap. This is to clean the wig. I use the same shampoos for my hair, but there are special wig shampoos. Because this is a wig and not real hair, don't expect a lot of suds. Be sure to wash the hairs at the back of the head that are rubbing against your neck. Since this wig was used for styling, there's a lot of product that needs to be washed out. Even though the fibers are heat resistant, I always use lukewarm water as it's better for the wig. While washing the wig, I'm doing my best not to move it too much as I don't want to tangle it. Once the shampoo has been rinsed off, apply a small amount of conditioner to the outside of the wig. Again, try not to move the fibers too much while doing this. Once the conditioner has been worked into the wig, close the drain and fill the sink with water. Be sure to hold the wig out of the way when you close the drain so none of the fibers are caught. Fill the sink full enough so that the wig is fully covered by water, but don't swish the wig around. Let it sit in the conditioner bath for 10 to 15 minutes depending on how tangled it is. Once the wig has sat, 
drain the sink, and again, be sure to keep the end of the wig away from the drain. Rinse off the conditioner, again using lukewarm water, and being sure not to move the wig too much. Once fully rinsed, squeeze out some of the excess water. To dry the wig, lay it flat on a towel. Or, if you have one, a collapsible wig stand works great for letting the wig dry. These are also a lot easier to transport than wig heads, so are great for bringing to overnight conventions. Last thing to note, be sure your wig is completely dry before you go to detangle it. For storing your wigs, store styled wigs on wig heads. For unstyled wigs, fill them with tissue paper or turn them inside out, wrap them in the netting they originally came in if you still have it, and place them in a bag. Be sure to braid long wigs to keep them from getting tangled. Wig attachments. Another common question we receive is about attaching horns or ears to a wig. So one method is to use small magnets. You can sew the magnet to the wig by putting it into a small fabric pouch and then have the magnet on your ear or horn piece. It makes for a very seamless look. I have also seen sewing snaps into the wig. Um, the benefit of the magnet is it's easier to conceal, so you can reuse that wig for multiple characters. I want to thank you all for tuning in today and hope that you learned a lot of valuable information about wigs. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Cosplay Repair Station or Cosplay Repair. Use our hashtag Cause It Breaks to share your wig ventures with us. And be sure to check out the wig pamphlet on our website as well as our other cosplay pamphlets. If you ever have questions about wigs or any cosplay topic, feel free to reach out to us through our social media or email us at cosplayrepair at gmail.com. Thanks again, stay safe, and enjoy the rest of your Geek Girl Con online.